Don't study law, Jefferson. Study men. I do remember the last time I saw her. She was standing on an auction block. We intend for independence. He tells me that he wanted liberty and equality. But fear within a city. A free white English woman. Of course, Lord Cornwallis himself. Friends, you have been a delight. I, it is always a pleasure. The dignity and worth of human personality. October 1775, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Peyton Randolph, President of the Continental Congress, has died. A period of public mourning is observed all over the country with black banners printed on newspapers, funeral processions, and eulogies written for the departed. Six months later in Williamsburg, another death is felt by the Randolph household. Bratchus, an enslaved elder in the community, has died. Once again, those in the Randolph family must grapple with death in the household. It won't be the same without him here. No, not Mr. Randolph. Bratchus. Losing Bratchus after we've lost so much already doesn't yet feel real to me. He was a steady, ever-present force here. He looked out for every one of us on the property and taught us more than we'll ever know. He was a father to me and a grandfather to my son. We'll scarcely have time to bury him today. There's work to be done. These last few months have been a blur. To think just this past summer, we were making preparations to go to Philadelphia. This would be my first time for myself and Mrs. Randolph. And as Mrs. Randolph's ladies made, I would be going too. Walking those streets in a new place with new people, and I began to think, for the smallest of moments, that I almost feel just a little bit free. That was until Benjamin... One of Mr. Wisman came to us and told us to come quickly. Mr. Randolph was not doing well. By that night, he was gone. Any time. Perhaps even more present for us. Will there be a need for better than 20 people at the house now that Mrs. Randolph is a widow? Is there debt that needs to be paid, and how will it be paid? Has any one of us been bequeathed to a niece or nephew? And what of my son George? He is my son, yet I have no control over what will happen to him. If Mr. Randolph has a debt to be paid or a nephew to appease, there is every chance that my son will be used for it. At least, for now, I have some relief in knowing that I will stay on the property as Mrs. Randolph's lady's maid. What of my son? Bratches once told me to pray for myself and the others on the property every day and hope that your answered prayer does not come because of someone else's heartbreak. Today, I feel that heartbreak. There will be no black bands and ribbons for him, no black borders in the newspaper, no obituary, no public displays of mourning for an enslaved man of Mr. Peyton Randolph. But he will be mourned. He will be remembered. We must make ready to return Bratches to the earth. The only thing that's certain is change. I thought I was past this. The melancholy. My woman Eve has informed me that our Bratches has died. Mind you, I could tell you little and lay a word from him, but yes, missus, or good day, missus. But his passing has had a greater effect on me than I expected. He was always there. Part of the day. Part of my life these last thirty years, and now he's gone. Yet another part of my existence gone. Another person gone that would remember how life was just six months ago. 
It has been six months since my husband, Mr. Randolph, paid his debt to nature. The funeral in Philadelphia was quite unlike anything I could have imagined. So much pomp and circumstance. Such a display of public mourning I have never seen before. Peyton would have hated it, but he would have understood the necessity of a display of unity. I left him there, you know, in Philadelphia. I wanted to bring him home to Williamsburg to be interred in the college vault with his parents. But I was advised against it, at least for the time being, until the safety of his remains could be assured. So I have returned to this empty house. I've spent the majority of my life acting the part of hostess, ensuring the comfort of all those around me. Thirty years managing the house of one of the most prominent men in Virginia. Never for a moment doubting my education as a gentry lady. Managing every detail, but no one teaches you how to be alone. Lately, even the slaves seem wary of making a sound, eager to please, but silent. Perhaps hoping their presence will slip my mind when the time comes to sell portions of the estate to answer debts. Nighttime is the worst of all. No sound of his breathing or mumbling in his sleep. <laughs> I even miss his cold feet. Almost every night I had a hot brick wrapped in flannel put in the bed. I cannot tell you how many times I had to stick my feet out from the coverlet to escape the heat. But his feet were always cold against my limbs. Do you know what I am now? Legally, I mean. A relict. Mr. Johnson's dictionary defines the word as a wife desolate by the death of her husband. Desolate meaning solitary, without society. The wife of the Speaker of the House of Burgesses, the President of the Continental Congress, mistress over 27 slaves on this property, and somehow without my husband, I am without society. And so I'm left to wonder, is that all I am? The will is read. Peyton's man Johnny is left to our nephew Edmund, and there are a few other bequests here and there, but for the most part... My dear husband left nearly everything to me, and I am named first among the executors. Clearly he thought me capable, even if I am now diminished in the eyes of others. And in the end, my husband's life, our life, is reduced to nothing more than a few pieces of paper. The business of the house must proceed. Bratches must be buried. And sooner or later my husband brought home. Thus another funeral here. Another reminder that I am a relict. Am I even needed now? Nobody teaches you how to be alone. Peyton has been gone for six months, but I can still hear him calling my name. Johnny. Johnny! I could sometime anticipate hearing my name called before he even takes the breath to do so. I've always hated being called Johnny. It sounded like an attempt to reduce me to a child. My name is John. The rest of Peyton's people, even our beloved elder, Bratches, respected me enough to call me John. Bratches used to always call me by my first and last name. He would always say to me, don't ever let them take your name from you. You are John Harris. Be proud of your name. I've always been by Peyton's side. We traveled to England, Boston, New York, and many other places. I even accompanied him to his last destination, Philadelphia, where he presided as the president of the Continental Congress. I stood by his side as his trusted manservant for years. He told me things in confidence. We shared laughs, secrets, and tears. I was his devoted servant, and that gave me privileges within his society. But being his devoted servant cost me. It prevented me from having a wife and children, as I always had to think of Mr. Speaker's needs before my own. Perhaps because of that devoted service, he has mentioned me in his will, not to give me my freedom after a life lived in someone else's service, but to pass me on. 
He has willed me to his nephew, Edmund. I feel so degraded, used, and neglected. <laughs> After a lifetime of devotion to this family, he hasn't even allowed me to stay here and be around the only family I've ever known, my family. I have spent most of my life devoted to Peyton. But being devoted to Peyton made me not be devoted to myself. Just when I thought I would have some reprieve from a life of service, I must start again. To have to always be listening for someone to call out for Johnny. But Peyton has died, and Johnny has died with him. My name is John Harris, and I will not let them take that from me. Mrs. Randolph, I appreciate you taking time out of your very busy day to share some conversation with us and with a great number of guests who have joined us and I'm sure share in sending their condolences at the loss of your dear husband, Speaker Randolph. Um, we want to encourage those who have joined us to ask any questions they may have of Mrs. Randolph. I believe we are also going to be joined by two of her people, Eve and John Harris, but before we introduce Eve and John Harris, Mrs. Randolph, I hope you don't mind if I ask, how have things been going? Are you faring well? I thank you for asking. And truth is, I welcome the company and the conversation. It's been so very quiet here. Um, some days are better than others, but today thus far seems a good day. And I am always happy for company and conversation, as I said. Thank you. I believe we're also joined by two of your people, Eve and John Harris. Good afternoon, John Harris and Eve. Uh, thank you for being with us even in this time of, uh, of extremis, this time of stress, and this time of mourning. Uh, we understand that you have had um, two deaths close to you, um, one quite close, uh, Bratches. Um, we have uh, lots of people watching, um, and, uh, and we can engage in a, a mutual conversation about, uh, about death, about mourning, uh, about grief in the 18th century. So uh, my question for both of you is, uh, how long have you lived here in the Randolph household, and how long have you known Bratches? Well, I have lived here uh, since I was born, so I will not tell you exactly how long ago that was, but... Uh, <laughs> since I was a babe and now I am uh, grown and have a son of my own. And Bratches, he has been here the entire time. Um, he was constant. Uh, my, father, my father passed when I was quite, quite young, quite small, and my mother when I was about 16. So Bratches, he was the one who was there, like a, like a father to me, <laughs> giving advice, uh, wit, proverbs. And once I became a mother, he also, in turn, became a grandfather uh, for my son, George, as these last few years of his life. He was the one who was responsible for looking after the children, mostly. Oh, well, uh, good day. Thank you for having me. Uh, yes, thank you. I've been here for as long as I can remember. Uh, this has always been home to me, and Bratches, well, he meant a lot, and it all depended on the circumstance of what role he played in my life. He was a father at times, a brother, a friend, uh, an instructor, uh, a wealth of wisdom. I remember 
him telling me something all the time. He would tell me before I enter any situation, never chew your rice while it's hot. Mm. Meaning that you should have good control over your emotions before you communicate. And I've, I've done well with it sometimes, not so well with others, but I promise you, Branches, I will do my best to follow your instruction. <clears throat> Thank you. I, I believe that uh, sound advice from Brashes, we, we could all take uh, from that advice. I, I believe our next question is for Mrs. Randolph. Yes, uh, Mrs. Randolph, um, I have read in the newspapers and heard it talked about in Williamsburg that the funeral and procession for your dear departed husband in Philadelphia was quite something to behold. I was wondering, Madam, for those of us who were not able to be there, if you could describe it a bit. Well, honestly, if you wish to know of the particulars of the processional, you may simply look to the newspaper, either the Philadelphia one or even the Virginia Gazette, which is easily enough found. It details exactly the procession, but it was unlike any sort of pomp and circumstance I could even have imagined. There were regiments riflemen, artillerymen, the body, of course, supported by six magistrates. There were clergy, there were the members of the Congress, there were the committees of safety in Philadelphia, the government of, of Pennsylvania, so on and so forth. And then it, someone estimated to me between 12 and 15,000 people, simply citizens of Pennsylvania, turned out for the procession. It was a display unlike anything I have ever seen before and honestly hope to see again. They reckon it to be greater than any funeral that has thus far been held in America. If I can take any comfort from it, it was that such a display was put forth for my dear husband in a city that was not his home. Thank you, Mrs. Randolph, for answering that. And um, I have one more question that perhaps Eve and John Harris will also be able to answer in their own perspective after. It's a question from our friend Robert. And he has asked, how long does the mourning period usually last? And what activities or displays does that time usually entail? Well, Robert, I think that mourning is a, a, a personal affair. Uh, there are general ideas about what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. And what I have found in the last several months is that no matter what choice you made, it is going to offend somebody's sensibilities. In the past, before all of our political troubles began, I think my mourning would have been more visible. You may have noticed the only black that I am wearing is a breast knot and a ribbon on my hat. And that is due to the Continental Association that we are under right now. It is, for the most part, a non-importation agreement. It is a political protest that my husband agreed to as the president of the Congress at the time. And it also has in it dictates for mourning. And it says that the only thing that should be allowed for a woman is a black ribbon and for a man, a black armband. 10 years ago, five years ago, I might have bedecked myself in black for several months and then uh, simply had black accessories for the remainder of the time. Uh, black ruffle, uh, sleeve ruffle, neck ruffle, black kerchief, black cap, that sort of thing. But now I am restricted to the ribbon. I will mourn my husband for the rest of my days, but I think that as far as a formal mourning is concerned, generally six months to a year is considered customary. Thank you, Mrs. Randolph. Perhaps uh, Eve and John Harris might have something to say about mourning practices as well. Uh, yes, uh, John and Eve, um, what, are, what are their usual customary mourning practices for enslaved people? Do you have a, a, a mourning custom that uh, transcends uh, generations or uh, geography? Uh, what, is, uh, what is the practice of grieving? Well, I would say first uh, the custom is to um, wash the deceased, um, to wrap them, um, to return them to the earth. And um, once a person is returned to the earth, 
you will see sometimes um, shells or, or, or some indication that uh, that is where they do rest. Um, one of the proverbs that um, Bratches and many of the elders uh, that I have learned from say is that no one is gone unless they are forgotten. So I would say that it falls on all of us who are there to the property to keep mentioning Bratch's name. Um, my son, George, he will be 10 soon. Um, so he had a, a good, good time, good long time with Bratch's, but there will be children who will come behind him on the property who, who will not know him face to face, but they will know him because of the stories they tell about him. And um, that, is, that is something that we, we seek to do with the, all of those that have passed on before us, is to just keep speaking their name so they can be remembered. And, and oftentimes, this is not something that falls only to those of us who are owned who have passed away. Um, but I, I dare say there are most people who are enslaved have a relative, someone that they have lost track of, whether they have have been sold somewhere, whether they have been transferred, whether they have given as a, away as a part of a dowry, or the circumstance that we find ourselves in now, um, a will and a state waiting to be settled. So we speak the names of those who, who we have lost to death, but we also speak the names to those who, who we have lost, and we do not know where they are. Hi, and uh, very much like what Eve said, we do wash the body, and return it to the earth as humans derived from the earth, as I've been told. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's no actual constraints or beginning and ending to grieving. And uh, I will humor my mistress and the other citizenry here by wearing this armband, but you can't put put boundaries on grieving. And those that have put boundaries on grieving are the same people that can say that another person is property. So, for showing, I will grieve for the allotted time, but what I actually feel is that you never stop grieving. Mm. We're going to uh, stay with you, John and Eve, if that's all right. The, you were speaking of uh, well, speaking, saying someone's name through time and, and carrying their story with you today. And yet you also spoke of, uh, of uh, something about inheritance or what might be divided now that, uh, not speaking of Bratches, but of speaking mm -hmm. of Mr. Randolph's death. And suddenly the word inventories comes to mind. Mm -hmm. When I say that word, what, how does it apply to you or not apply to you, this writing in ink that literally dictates your life? Well, we, we did know that, that it was, was coming um, not too long into to this year that we are in now. Um, I think it was Mr. Craig, Mr. Pierce, and Mr. Dixon um, did come to the house to take an assessment of everything within the home, um, to give it a value, and if, if need be, if, if, if there is debt left, as people have paid Mr. Randolph what they owe him, and as Mr. Randolph's estate does pay those that, that he does owe, if there is still debt that needs to be paid, we know that everything and everyone written down on that page could possibly be sold. Now, everything started um, within the home with the things. Oh, but as they be began to move out of doors, that is when um, I began to get a little unnerved, and you can perhaps see that just recalling it unnerves me a little bit. Now here um, to, to Williamsburg, and, and actually most of the slaves in the colony, um, we were born here, our parents before us, grandparents, and even great-grandparents before us, before us were born into slavery. But we do know of, and we still do sometimes see on occasion, those poor souls that are brought directly um, from the continent of Africa, and sometimes from the Caribbean. And, um, well, when they are assessed, it is something that um, it would take a person without a soul to feel empathy for them. Um, how they are stood up before people who, who may wish to purchase them. Um, how they are examined. And I will leave it um, at that. So that is what I did have in mind. Um, so when they began to make their way um, about the yard and the outbuildings to look for us, I did have that in mind. I was asked 
very personal questions about my age, about when I came into my womanhood, about how many children I did have, how many births were live, how many were not, um, if there had been children that had not been brought to term. And um, mostly what upset me the most was how my son George and some of the other children were treated, where they were made to open their mouth and show their teeth. So it was, it was yet a reminder, as there is always a reminder, um, that we are viewed as property by the law um, and by many people, and even the days and sometimes even less than that, the moments that we have, we do not know what may happen to us. For me, it shows the pure hypocrisy of these men. These men tell us that they're Christian. Hmm. And these men write the laws. They write the laws that say that we are human pieces of property. But that's changed when they feel the need to change, just like a, a horse can't be put to death for treason. I can, but I can't own property because I'm property myself. But I spoke of the Christianity of these men. And I had a look. I used to attend church services with Mr. Speaker. And at the Bruton Parish Church, I noticed something that told me it was all a lie. At the front of the church stands the preacher who preaches. The very front row, you have your wealthy landowners. Behind them, you have your shopkeepers and middling folk. And in the back, you have your poor whites, your free blacks, and some Negroes who are slaves. So as I sat there, I asked myself, if Jesus was to walk into this room, where would he sit? And if he's going to sit in the back, how is it the house of the Lord if Jesus can't have a good seat there? Thank you, Eve. Thank you, John. We're going to turn to Mrs. Randolph. Mrs. Randolph, uh, there's been a question about inventories, mm. and I know that that has been one of the first things that has been on your mind since the passing of Mr. Speaker. And uh, I was wondering if perhaps you could speak to a little bit of the process and also how that must have been having you experience your household being inventoried. I don't think I was truly prepared. Well, I don't think you can ever be prepared for any of it. But imagine a committee of men, in this case it was three, known to me, thankfully. But imagine people coming through your house, opening every drawer, going through every press, every chest, examining absolutely everything that you own, picking up all your fine things. I suppose they tried to be careful, but going through every room in your home and looking for anything of value and then doing the same thing elsewhere on your property through all of the buildings and speaking to all of your people. How old are you? What do you do? How many children do you have? And so on and so on and so on. And assigning it all a value so that in the end your life gets reduced to what, a few pieces of paper? And I know why it is done. I know it is done because they must determine what has value, what can be sold to settle any debts due to the estate, but that does not change the fact that it is such an invasion. And my husband has been specific. In his will, he stated that the first thing to be sold for debts were to be his books. And so once it is determined what the estate still owes, those will be the first thing to be sold. And then after that, he said, next should be any of the people belonging to the outlying plantations. But it is my hope that it will come to very little in terms of selling anything. But I know that the possibility remains. Thank Yet you. another change. Thank you, Mrs. Randolph. And on the same subject, we have several questions um, from Kimberly and from Christine, both in the same vein, asking about now that you are a widow and your husband has passed, how will you afford the upkeep of your property and does the estate produce any type of income? And will that continue now that Mrs. 
uh, Mr. Speaker is no longer here. Thankfully, ladies, my husband thought me a capable lady. <laughs> Uh, a fair amount of the estate was left to me directly, and it will be mine to determine what shall become of that part of the estate that he has left to me. The remainder of the estate, with a few bequests here and there, uh, are mine for my lifetime, and so I do have a means of sustenance. Um, we live in the city, but my husband does have plantations in the countryside. I suppose I have to get used to saying I have plantations in the countryside. And those will bring in an income. There is also always the possibility that you, if you have a slave that you are not using, they may be rented out. That's a common enough practice, even when the master is living. So I have means of an income. I have no worries there. I was well provided for. And even if my husband had not provided for me, Virginia law protects widows. Uh, in that they are guaranteed at least one-third part of their husband's estate or no less than a child is left to make certain that we do not fall as a burden upon the parish and the community. Speaking on widows' rights, <laughs> Mrs. Randolph, if we could hear a little bit more of them. In fact, Verna has asked a more specific question to that about could the widow overrule any part of a will, um, for instance, in order to keep pieces of property with her should she wish, or are they set in law? And does the widow's rights have anything to do with that? Uh, Verna, yes, a woman, a widow can uh, oversee the will. However, it is a headache that I would not wish to endure. Um, I know of a lady, um, a, a Mrs. Corbin, who when her husband died, uh, she was left a fair part. She was in a somewhat similar situation to myself, although, with one child, and she was much younger. She did not see fit to uh, settle the estate in the way that her husband wished and had set forth in his will. And so she did have to bring the matter before the courts, but she did ignore portions, and it had to be an act of government in order to do that. But as a widow and as an executor, because she was made an executor as I am of my husband's will, it is in your power to take these matters to the court and say, well, the sa say for example, the sale of this would benefit more than the sale of these people, or the sale of these people would be of better benefit, and so on and so forth. So it is possible to either renounce the will and disagree with it entirely, or to have different portions of the will re-examined, but it does have to go before the court to do so. Thank you for that further explanation, mm -hmm. Mrs. Randolph. I appreciate it. I believe our next question is for um, Mr. Harris. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, John, this question is from Donald. Donald is wondering about uh, after Peyton Randolph's death, uh, if he had granted you your freedom what might have been your next action? Hmm. Well, thank you for the question, Donald. Well, hmm. My next action would be to move far away from Virginia. Uh, perhaps somewhere in the Western Territories past, uh, uh, west of the Alleghenies. Uh, the naturals there they don't see your skin color. They see you for who you are. In fact, uh, and well, that would be exactly what I would need. Being here in Virginia, just seeing me with my skin and my skin color, the assumption would be that I was a slave and I could be jailed just for existing and I would not be allowed out of jail until some free white man vouched for my freedom. I would like to rid, my, rid myself of that constant fear. That, that, would, that would be my next move. It's about safety, your own safety and security. Well, it, actually, it could be for the safety and security for a slave patroller wishing to take me up. So it, it would work better for everyone if I were out of, what, what do you call this, a slave society. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a society that runs only because enslaved people are there. 
So yes, I, I, I would take myself away from this place, quickly. Thank you, John. Uh, we're going to stay with you, Eve, for this next question. Diane is wondering, was it common for people to have written a will, or is that something only the gentry or wealthy uh, folks do? do? Do middling sorts or uh, enslaved people have or write wills? Uh, well, thank you for the question, um, Diane, um, that, that I have known and have, have seen here it as something um, that free people do. But I do certainly know of, of free Negroes who live in and around the city um, who have made provisions for, for their loved ones, for their loved ones, pardon me, um, in the event of their passing. Um, what comes to mind most immediately um, is the circumstance of, of the Ashby's. And um, I will fill you in as quickly as, as I can. Um, Matthew Ashby, um, his mother was a, a white woman and his father was a Negro man, which meant that he was bound out for the first 31 years of his life. Um, and he worked till 31 and he was free. And um, over the course of time, um, he did join with a woman by the name of Anne. And um, they had three children. So Matthew, he worked it out with um, Mr. Uh, Spur, I believe, who was Anne and the children's master, because the law says the status of the child is that of the mother bond or free. Um, he worked it out that he would purchase his wife and their children for 150 pounds. And that is quite a good deal of money. That might be what it would take Matthew years to earn. Now, he earned up the money, and unfortunately, before he could raise it all, um, one of his children did pass. He still owed 150 pounds to Mr. Spur. So he purchased Anne, he purchased his two sons, but do you see what has happened? That does not make them free. That just makes them the slaves of Matthew himself. And for a lot of free Negroes, that is as far as they can take it. But Matthew, he was able to petition the governor's council and get freedom for his wife and his two children. Now, very sadly, within the space of two years, Matthew himself, he had paid his debt to nature, but he provided um, his wife with a dwelling space and also with the... Um, well, with, her, with everything that she would need, she is a laundress. So that would be things like copper pots, wash tubs, that sort of thing. So it is something that is very, very common and, and very, very necessary for the free Negroes, not, not too many, but there are some about that we know who live within the city and outside of the city to ensure that their family is taken care of um, once they have passed on. Thank you, Eve. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to go to Mrs. Randolph for our next question. Mrs. Randolph, we were just speaking about wills, and in particular, uh, your activity in enacting your husband's will, but there has been a question in regard to women writing wills, uh, particularly if it was common for women to write them or if it was something just in the gentry class. Well, I, I know that wills are fairly common, certainly. Uh, the numbers of wills, I could not hazard a guess. I suppose you will find them more commonly amongst the gentry, and, and even not all gentlemen write them, or ladies for that matter, but um, simply because there is more to be left, uh, to be left to one person or another, or if there are particular things you want left to one person or another. Um, I have every intention, although I really did not wish to think on it so soon, but. I do intend to write a will myself. I would say they are probably more common amongst the gentry, but I know gentry folks, men and women, that have died without wills, or as they say, intestate. Um, more important, of course, if the husband should predecease the wife. But I have intention of doing so. I just haven't been able to bring myself to do it yet. Well, certainly, perhaps after some time. Mm. Um, Mrs. Randolph, we do have a question from Rebecca, and she asks, um, do you feel any sense of duty in, keep, in terms of keeping enslaved people who are married or who are families intact? Um, and I am to understand that you recently have lost a member of your enslaved community, Bratches, who is an elder, and she even mentions your thoughts on selling older slaves. So I suppose that question then is somewhat twofold. Yes. Um, uh, there are measures in place 
that are put there, whatever your own personal feelings might be regarding the treatment of slaves. There are measures also put in place regarding, uh, as far as the law is concerned. I have not, to my recollection, sold an older slave, uh, simply because when you are selling a slave, usually it is for one of two purposes. There is a very good reason, or you need the money. And for the most part, an older slave is not going to gain you very much money. Now, as to keeping families together, I know my people on the property here in town. I cannot claim to know all of their family connections that are not in town. I have, for the most part, tried to keep mothers and children together for the most part, but it's not always possible. It is a very complicated situation. And the truth of the matter is, as I said, sometimes you are certainly aware of, of mothers and children, but not necessarily of uh, fathers and cousins and so on and so on and so forth. I have not given it all that much thought. I will say this. If you were to separate mother and child, it can be to the detriment of your household uh, because any sort of sorrow would certainly have a great effect on the workings of your household. So if it can be avoided, it is advisable. It cannot always be avoided. Sometimes there is simply a matter of practicality that must be attended to. Thank you, Mrs. Randolph. And I believe, unfortunately, our time is growing short with you. Um, and indeed, we don't want to take up all of your day, but we do have one final question for you, is what's next for you? <laughs> I wish I knew. <laughs> what is next for any of us? I, I, I do not know. I, I, I suppose if I were a younger woman, I might remarry, but I cannot imagine I will do so now. And if anyone did show any interest, I would worry that they would be more concerned about my fortune than my person. Um, I suppose I will continue as I always have. I have been trained to look after the comfort of others. And so I will try to be a good member of my community, a good aunt to my nieces and nephews, uh, family member, mistress, and I will uphold my husband's wishes. I'm sure you will be all of those things and more, Mrs. Randolph. I thank you for your time. I think we have one final question for John Harris and Eve, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, this last question is for you both, uh, John Harris and Eve, and we'll go in that order. So, uh, but it's the same question. So for you, uh, John, looking to the future, what are your hopes for yourself and your family, your community? Hopes. Well, because of the constraints of the law, I can't have hopes there. I can have imaginations. I can imagine things. I can imagine that the first, the attitude towards the Negro will change, and then the law, because if you do one before the other, then nothing changes. I would look and hope that we would want to make these colonies the strongest, and how you make them the strongest is to allow everyone to reach their full potential. The cash crop here is tobacco, but Africans came with the knowledge to grow and cultivate the tobacco. So why not credit us with our knowledge? And if you do have us as empl employees, pay us. Allow us to prosper as well. Your society will not grow if you keep a segment of it in bondage. It's good for no one. For one, for the people that own us, you're corrupting yourself. It's unnatural for man to own man. And it gives you a lofty, unrealistic view of yourself. So if we could just put everything on actual footing, stop calling these landowners planters because they didn't plant anything, if, if we're just honest about a society, then it can actually grow to something big, beautiful, and unstoppable. Those are my hopes for the future. And Eve, uh, same question. Well, I have, as I said, um, 
been on this property my entire life. And you have family that is related to you by blood, but you have people that become family to you because that is the person that you see every day, in and out, through good times and bad. So I wish that I could have some confidence and assurance that the family that I have could be the family that is, that is always around me. And to broaden it, we are a city in which a little over half of us are, are Negro. So it is not just those of us to, to the property that Mrs. Randolph now has, but it is friends to, to Mr. Wiss, Abram and, and, and Benjamin and Lydia, and friends to, um, to the Raleigh that Mr. Suffall does own, Kate and, and Fanny and, and Dinah, and all of these people, they have become family to me. But so much in our lives is so out of our control that in an instant, any one of us could be gone, sold, uh, transferred, and inherited or sent away. But just to, to know that the family that I have can be with me and around me, be safe, be secure, and be loved. That is my hope. Thank you for watching today's program, Death in the Household. This project was funded in part by a generous grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. Please come and visit Colonial Williamsburg for more stories like these.